These questions are designed to unfold and explain your teachings and are asked in the context of the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, which reflect the ancient wisdom. There is the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? This, whatever, at each moment, is who I am about necessarily having to have something that's substantial behind it. But there is a sense of arrival when one feels at one with the energies everywhere, as if one has a feeling of settling into one's place that was always there in the universal energy, and then coming from there is a feeling that this is who I am. But at the same time, it's possible that even beyond that, that there is a place where you cannot actually answer the question except to smile or to do the next thing that you're going to do or say the next thing that you're going to say. It comes out of nowhere. Hmm. Thank you. Many seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? Well, the moment you ask the question, you make it an object. And I look at this object and I can't, I can't find this object. <laughs> so I don't know really what it is, but I think it's only something that some people can attribute to other people, but that the person who they attribute it to, I doubt can actually make the statement, I am enlightened. They can maybe say, I am, I am what I am, I am that I am, I am this, I am that, touch my massy maybe, as the Indians say, but I don't think it's possible to say, I am enlightened. I can say that I feel often surrounded by a great deal of light. I can feel that somehow, sometimes that I'm in the middle of a, a powerful light phenomenon. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily what people mean when they say a person is always enlightened. So, I think really is for other people to look upon somebody else and say, in my view, or in my feeling, this person is enlightened. But I think it's actually irrelevant whether you have that definition or not. I mean, if you're doing something which is beneficial to other people and which is bringing people more to their truth or to their completion, then I think that deserves the highest praise maybe as possible and doesn't really need a categorization like enlightenment. <clears throat> and for example, in your own experience, was there a particular moment when something happened? Yes. Or was it something gradual? Both. I think that I had a number of Sartori experiences in my life. Um, some of them in Pune, when I was first there, which, which Bhagwan, as he was then acknowledged as being a Satori, where everything kind of disappeared, or I disappeared out of the world. I remember one occasion when I was doing a leader group, which was my group there, it was my birthday, and when I went into the group, everybody somehow had learned that it was my birthday, and they all picked me up, and they, they put 
me up in the air and they swung me back and forth and they sang me songs and suddenly in an instant I was not up there, I was somewhere far down below wondering what on earth these guys are doing and what is a birthday and a birthday is meaningless, every day is a birthday and what what all the excitement about and somehow I fell into a space and I stayed in there for several days. Um, so that was an enlightenment experience. But I don't, but then, you know, sometimes that was maybe one of the strongest satoris I'd had, but I maintain that the early satoris are always the strongest because of the contrast between the place you, you were in and the place that you're thrown into. If that's really a great leap, then you really feel this is an incredible experience. And then, but as you go on working on yourself or with other people, with a teacher, you get nearer and nearer. So then the, the jump into the same sort of space doesn't feel so grandiose as it did the first time. But I look upon my awareness of, of simple reality happening when I was on a walk. I was doing a seminar in the summer of... 1994, I think it was, in Germany, and I was going for a walk in the break, and then I saw two birds flying by, and there was nothing else but the birds flying by. That was all, all that there was. And then I went back to, the, to the, join the people for the afternoon session, and the way that I was was completely fresh for me. I mean, in a way, I was the same person, in a way, the people were there, but something had happened, and everybody knew that something had happened. And so there was a transformation of some sort, but it wasn't something that I could say, well, this or that has happened. You know, I've become enlightened, or I've seen, or I'm having a satori. It was something that took place in a kind of indescribable level, but it made a great conversion to my, uh, my reality. And I, I think I recognize that as being a, a significant moment. And I think somehow it's got mixed up with a realization that also I attribute to what I attribute a great leap of understanding for me that I had the greatest thought, I mean, I had a busy mind, like most people, I've been, you know, I've been to the university, to Cambridge, and I've been with a lot of intelligent friends and long discussions in the night, so I had a good mind. Uh, and was always somehow looking at things and trying to bring some fresh intelligence to it. And then uh, at this time, I had this realization that what I wanted in life, my mind was not going to be able to, to, reach, to, to find for me. And from that moment, I have had no trouble with my mind. That if my mind is busy, I can just turn away, I can simply stop thinking, I think I'm thinking about something, oh, it's going a bit crazy now, not getting anywhere, I can just stop it. Because I no longer believe that listening to the mind, sooner or later, is going to produce the goods. So I can let it go. So that, I'm not sure if that coincided with the experience with the birds, or it was happening on the same day, but it was the two things together. I'm letting go of the mind, and out of that, finding the empty space in which no mind interfered with the simple experience of seeing a bird flying. And would you say that from that moment it's been unchanging, or would you say that, um, you know, the mind came back to some extent? And, and uh... Well, I think that I skated on a certain level, which became more and more solid as time went on and has become particularly solid I think in the last couple of years and then it feels like a basic ground not something that I have to lose. I'm not saying that I never lose it because I do from time to time but I don't have to search for it anymore. I don't have to put my feelers out for it anymore. I feel that if I just let go of something that's taking me away from it very quickly, I simply land on it. I simply fall back on it. And it's that same feeling that I always had, that this is the basis of, of, of my existence. And it's the basis, basis of all existence too. Mm. 
Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is practice necessary? And if yes, what form do you advise? Well, I would imagine that all the practices that I did, all the groups that I did in my early days, all the meditations that I did, all the things I did in Pune, all the ways in which my teacher Rajneesh worked with me, they all made a significant contribution. But of course, when you arrive at a certain place, which is what I'm describing, the feeling is that you really didn't need to do anything to get there. That you're in fact clearing the way so that this could appear. So, in a way, I feel that I was privileged to be taken there. That I, although I did many things, uh, including after many years with Osho, that I was actually inevitably taken there. And that feels very different to working with people who in a way, I feel I'm instrumental in bringing them there. That maybe some of them will have the same experience of landing there without, in a way, any direct help from a, from a teacher. You know, but basically, I feel that I have found a way that is potentially available to every human being to reach the same space that I'm in. And that way is through a shift of energy levels, and that's what I work with. <clears throat> and of course you've been working now for many years with people, and probably very many people. Yes. Have you seen this happening to some of those people? Well, I see it happening all the time. In every seminar I see it happening, but it doesn't stay. And I see that the more often people get attracted or drawn to, to that level that I see as a level of, of oneness, then the more quickly they go into it and the longer they stay in it. But the, the center of gravity you know, it's like you can have an experience, you can be in a certain place, and then you can be transferred to the experience, and then the place that you're at then categorizes that experience, or describes that experience. It, it slots it into a certain picture that one is having of oneself and one's experiences, but the center of gravity doesn't shift in itself. It just says, aha, I had a satori. I had a satori. Now, of course, when you're in, a, in the space, you don't say, I'm having a satori. It's just where you are. You, know? you don't describe it anymore. So this movement of, of, of seizing an experience and saying, this is what I'm going to call it, or I'm going to tell you what happened, that the one who's speaking is coming from a place which is not in that experience. And that, and that one, which I was into gravity, slowly moves closer and closer, I believe, to that place, and then joins it. And then you're not saying, I'm having this other experience, it's just then it becomes, this is who I am. But, I, but in a way, everybody in a, in a seminar, many, many people in my seminars do go into an enlightened space over and over again. But they are not in it. I mean, their energy is in it. Their energy, you see I see, I see, I see that it's all to do with levels of vibration. And, and it's like the old-fashioned alchemy, where they try to change metal, base metals into gold. And the idea of doing it was to change the vibration of the metal into the vibration of gold, and then the metal would have no alternative but to become gold. You know? So in a way, it's very similar to this, that the feeling that 
if one connects with the dimension, the vibration of bliss, then you have no choice but to feel bliss. If you connect with the level of love, then suddenly you will feel love. You know, if you connect with the level of 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 oneness, then you will feel oneness with all things. If you connect with the level of a deep, peaceful tranquility, silence, peace, then that's where you will be. You know? So it's like through the work I do, I try and get people to connect with these or to access these levels, and when they do, they have the experience, no question. But they are having the experience, and they may have that experience a hundred times, or two hundred, or five hundred times, and each time is I'm having, I came out of the, I felt this incredible peace, or I felt my mind stopped. Somebody was in, in, wrote to me after my, my group, and just now in Bayman, you know, just one evening, she said, Time and space disappeared. My mind stopped. I was simply, absolutely, simply there. You know? So she had a, a question, a sort of experience. You know? And then she writes to me about it and says, Michael, thank you very much. I had that experience, you see. And you may have to have that experience a thousand times, you know, but you're still saying, I had that experience. Mm -hmm. But you're not yet being that space that you were in when you and you, who are not in that space, had the experience of being in that space. Right. So actually that comes on to the, na the next question very well, because in a way what you're suggesting is it's something to do with this I. You know? and, and Ramana, he said that self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. What do you say about self-inquiry, how to conduct self-inquiry? So this was his method of asking, you know, who am I? Yeah. And it somehow um, brings light onto this I, the identification. But I didn't find... I, you know, I remember something flashed me, and there was a, a magazine, I don't know whether it's still running, in England, in the early, many years ago, it just started off, I forget what it was called now, you know, a spiritual magazine. And then I put something in that magazine which said everybody, everybody is looking for God, or for an, I don't know whether it's God or for their Buddha, or not for God, inside themselves, whereas that is the only place where God is not. Strange thing to say. And the next week, in the letters column, a, a master of some sort had written saying, oh, Mr. Barnett is absolutely right, but he shouldn't say so. He should not tell people this because then they will stop the work. Because the only thing you can work with is yourself. Yeah. So the son was telling people, the only place where God is not is yourself. He's saying, now where do I look now? You know, where do I look? So that was came out, my say, making that statement came out of the feeling that that looking inside myself and finding all sorts of different levels, at some point it stopped. And then I found what I was looking for outside myself. And I don't know whether that connects with something that stuck in my memory with, uh, a master called um, Klein, a French master. French master, yeah. Mm. Right. He was from. He was from. He was from John Klein, I think. Jean John. Klein. Mm. He was, I think, from from Hungary or somewhere. But he was working in France, mm. and he has some some beautiful books he wrote, which I read. But I also saw a video of him, and he said. Someone asked him this question, how do you know if a teacher is the right teacher for you? And he said, does your teacher take you away from yourself? If he does, he's the right teacher for you. So it was like, that in order to find my own depths, I had to open to what was all around me, and tune in to what was coming, which was there in the environment, 
and which was coming into me or which is accessible to me, and that by finding something in these space dimensions, in space, that then it echoed in me. So it's like going out of myself in order to find myself. Or comes the Jesus quote, he who loses himself for my sake will find himself, who finds himself will lose himself. So it's a way of losing myself, or leaving myself alone and opening to the non-me, the not-me, and then finding what I was seeking in the not-me, and then because I found it, then of course I found it also in myself. And then the two became one. And then there was no separation between myself and everything else around me. When Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained, he replied, when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed. There will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world and how to remove the world? Well, you can remove the world at any moment. You can just drop it. It's just a movie. It's just a fascinating movie or many billions of movies all interacting with each other. You know, I'm reminded of a Zen story about the Master saying to the disciples, well, if the sun is coming up, who can make the sun go down? And one of the guys got up and he pulled the blind down. Beautiful answer. <laughs> so I believe in the same way you can pull the blind down on the world. And yet the world is still there, but you don't have to be caught up in it. You can you can find a space that excludes the world and you can move back and include it again. And a pure space of stillness and silence and oneness. There are no boundaries, there are no frontiers, there are no seams, so there's no objects, there's no separations, there's, there's no items. And one can, I can, one can, therefore one can simply do that almost at any moment, really. And the world just peace. And then it comes again when you turn towards it. So it's only there as long as you participate in it in some way, as long as you enter it. But if you stop participating in it and you find a place you can go to when you're not participating, you're not dependent on it in the sense that most people are, that if they don't participate in the world, they feel they don't exist. If you can find a nice isolation place that's independent of the world, then the world is peace. And in that place, there is nothing negative that you can do to anybody. Impossible, because you are one with everything. And you're not in the subject object, you're not in the conflicts, you're not in this versus that, me versus you, this religion versus that religion, this country versus that country, this belief system against that belief system. It all vanishes in a flash. Flash goes, and you're out of it, and you're just still there, and you can return. <clears throat> it has been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind, and how to destroy the mind? No, you can't. You can't destroy the mind. <laughs> Mind is, when I talk about what I'm talking about, I can't do that without a mind, even though I'm not thinking. I'm just letting words come. My mind, my mind knows the words that I need to use in order to speak to you and answer your questions. So, I mean, my mind is, mind is beautiful, 
but it has to be mastered. I don't believe the mind is the master. I believe the one has a master beyond the mind. And with that you can master the mind and subdue it and stop its mischief <laughs> and get it to behave. And then it can participate with the rest of your being in its proper position and act. And that's the appropriate part of you through which to act. Could you say, for example, that there is a functioning mind and a thinking mind, and it's the thinking mind that has to go? Well, yes, I can say that. I mean, yeah, because when you're when you're when you're in when you're in thought, then then you are, in a way, captured. It's it captures you completely, and. And therefore, your reality is reduced to the particular thought that you're having, even though your thought might be about the whole world, for example. But you are caught up in an activity that is in time. You're lost in the part of the movie. The movie mind is part of the movie. And when the mind is still, and it's still there, but it's not, you're not captured anymore, you're free. And even if the mind then begins to move, you can, it's just like an activity, like you are nodding. I see you nodding, I see somebody moving the camera a bit there, I see somebody doing something here, falling asleep. <laughs> or whatever. And I, then maybe I can feel a, a thought moving here, you know, but I can, I can, just acknowledge that it's there, but I'm not captured by it. So the thing about thinking is that it captures people and they get lost in thought. But if thoughts are coming, I mean, I'm not sure how to describe the difference between thinking and now I'm talking, but I'm not thinking. So something is coming from my mind. Whatever I'm saying is coming from, from the reservoir, the silent reservoir of knowledge or experiences in my mind and I'm converting all that sense of my life into words and my mind is doing that but I'm not lost in it. I'm sitting here serenely listening to my <laughs> always I'm listening to myself speaking and I'm hoping it's making some kind of sense and I hope it's providing something about what you would like. <laughs> but I'm not somehow in, I'm not manipulating it, you know right. I'm, not, I'm not fixing it. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, there is this sense that when you, when you come to a certain understanding, then it's almost like a wireless, you know, the words come through, um, yes. but there isn't anything really, no, no processing somehow, no, it's just no. like so a who is flow. Yes. To happen. So then who am I? Who is the one who is speaking? Uh, right. That's what I said at the beginning, that I don't really know, you know, it's just happening. In the moment, you're asking me a question, and an answer is coming. Right. You know? Like the famous story of the goose is out. You know, you know the one that Maybe out. you could tell us that story. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Could, if you don't mind to tell us that story. Well, where the, the, the famous Zen Koan, you put, you put the, a, a little gosling into the bottle when it's very small, and then the, the, the Koan is how to get the goose out of the bottle without breaking the bottle. Well, I mean, the mind is the goose in the bottle, but if you stop thinking, then you're out of the bottle. So there's a famous story about a master called Nanzen, and Rico, his disciple, comes to him a master later and says, Master, he asked him this question, and the master doesn't say anything. And after that, he waits a little while, and then says, oh, he's not going to answer, so he walks away. And then Nanzen says, Rico! And Rico says, yes, master. He says, ah, the goose is out. Meaning, he just answers without thinking. He doesn't say, why is, why are you asking, what now, why? And now he's talking, and now he's asking me, maybe I can get an answer. In the instant he had heard his name called, he said, just master, and he said, the goose is out. And, was, and this is relevant for me, because once in Pune, when I was sitting there at a lecture, 
You know the story? Yeah. Well, you tell us. I mean, yeah. I do know it, but yeah, yeah, they so, don't know. Oh, right. <laughs> so sorry, no, no. <laughs> right. And Bhagwan is in the middle of a talk on Zen, and suddenly he shouts out, Samandra, the goose is out. You know? And I'm just sitting there with another five, four or five hundred people just listening to him. And I don't know. I looked around. I couldn't see any, any <laughs> goose around. But, but anyway, it's like in that instant, you can, you can just for a flash responding without thought. And then you are in an empty space. And if you actually, the mind stops, then there's consciousness. But without would you, anything in it. Would you say that you're operating from that most of the time? Or more when you're doing your seminars? For more example? when I'm doing my seminars, you know, when I'm talking one of the things about one of the things, I'm talking about football, <laughs> you know, or a movie that I've seen, or I'm chatting with my, my kids or something, then I'm, then I'm not in that space. Sometimes I can feel that space there at the same time as I'm functioning in an everyday way. I can feel it's there, but it's not appropriate to be in, medicine, in that space, maybe with my kids, you know, because they're asking specific questions, maybe about specific matters, you know. So, you know, my, my, my empty space is probably not probably so interested in that, so I see them smile enigmatically at them, it's not quite appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> mm. However, is it true to say that small children are very often naturally in that space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I, often parents, not often, sometimes, Parents bring their kids to get a name, you know, I'm in a seminar and the kids come, especially in the summer at an event or when there's families come or the winter event. But other times too, they bring their kids to get a name, you know. And I always give them the name in the seminar, you know, not privately, so they have to come. And all the people in the seminar are sitting there, maybe 50, 80 people, and the kid comes and sits in front of me, you know, for his name. And nearly always, when they do, they look up here. Look at them like this. And they smile and they look and they look around like this as if they're seeing something that never, the adults cannot see. But they connect with some energy, I guess. You know, that's, so then has not yet been eliminated as non real. <laughs> they haven't yet any science about <laughs> Which told them it's all nonsense, you know, and only what you can touch and feel and measure is reality. So mm. they're not yet confined. So they mm. just look and they respond to what they can see. And it's very nice. It always makes me smile to see that. And sometimes I can feel the interaction with them. It's so playful and, uh, and, and natural. So could you, uh, going back to that other question about enlightenment, could you say that... Um, that actually enlightenment, although it's a big word, is actually something very, very simple and not really different from the space where a small child is living. Uh -huh. Well, you know, everything is, is really relative. We can't help but measure things against our experience. Apart, even if we are very much in the present moment, somehow the mind is already, even if the mind is quiet, it's still got everything else stored away. You know? So. Of course, there are times when I fall into that space and I think, well, why isn't everybody in this place all the time? Because it's a very natural place. But then when I was telling you about how people, what happens to people in my seminars, how they fall in this experience and they're recording this experience, you know, and then they have to move more and more, the place that's recording it has to move towards it, then in a way that takes a long time. You know, so it's not simple. So I know that it's not simple, and at the same time, it appears simple, but relative to the way that we have all been indoctrinated uh, with our social conventions and, and, and belief systems, you know, I see that it's not simple. So sometimes I look and say, I say as I, I describe, well, I mean, why can't I be in this space all the time? Why can't everybody in this space be all, all the time? But then most of the time I see, well, you know, it's not, it is it's a simple place, but it's extremely difficult to fall into it, to let go of everything that's keeping away from it. But when you're in it, 
I mean, in a way, you know, I'm reminded of a story. A man says to a master, what do you do? I like this story. And he says, I work with human beings. And he, then the guy says, well, what are they after you finish working with them? And he said, no longer human beings. So, in that space of light and simplicity and ordinariness and presence, it's possible, often I don't feel as if I'm a human being anymore. Because human beings are people who have problems, who have difficulties, who are struggling, who are fighting, who get overwhelmed by things, who are aiming for goals and who are failing and so on. All this chaos and debris about human beings is, is not there anymore. And I think, well, what is the space? I mean, I can't call it human, otherwise I have to say everybody else is inhuman. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather say, I'm feeling non-human and they're all humans. There's such a contrast. It's not me against others, because I also can be in that place and I have most of my life, you know. But it's still, the place seems to be, I mean, somewhere, it's like what they call on the other side of the, at this, you know, the other shore. It feels like it's on the other shore. And you're looking at this shore and you're saying, well, I mean, that's somewhere else. I can go back there and I'm likely to be back there maybe shortly I'll find myself right back there. But where I am or here, I see that I'm not in what in the, in the world as people normally conceive it, as being a world which contains the situations and problems and what people are confronted with in life. That all that has vanished. It's like the blind has been pulled down, I'm in a place where everything is simple, straightforward, and there's nothing to be done, and I can just allow whatever comes through me to come through me. And anyway, it doesn't matter if there's nothing either. It's not quite happy just to be. So, for example, you were saying that in your seminars, it's very common that people come to this place you've just described. Yeah. But then you've also experienced that they, they seem to lose it. I mean, there's something happens, yeah? So, what about the tendencies of the mind? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? How to remove the tendencies? Can I, can I interrupt? Can you stop the camera? Yeah. I was saying that in your seminars, you had said, well, often people come into this space that you were just talking about, but then later oh, yes. they seem to lose that, yeah. they lose contact with that. Yeah. And even that could happen quite a few times. Yeah. Um, what about the tendencies of the mind? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? How to remove the tendencies? What do you mean by tendencies? I'm meaning like the structures, you know, like um, certain patterns that are, seem to be etched in the mind. Uh -huh. But when your mind goes quiet, then they disappear. Yeah, exactly. So then you seem to be in that nice space, yeah. but then you go to work tomorrow morning and yeah. then those structures take you back yeah, out yeah. of it. Yeah. And well, they don't have to go, but they have to be able to be let go of. They don't have to disappear. I doubt they can never disappear. Yeah, I think they are ingrained in, you know, so as soon as you start to function in, in time and space, in the world with other people, then they're, they're going to be the instruments through which you, you communicate and express yourself. You know? So I think that, I mean, the, the tendencies, as you call them, they seem to be the mind's influence upon our activities and, and what we choose to do and who we choose to be with and so on. And, and these tendencies are part of who you are in the world. But as I was saying, when you're in that space, you're not in the world. So you don't have any tendencies, and you don't need any tendencies. I mean, there's... I mean, the tendencies come from the... from, the, from your lifetime's interaction with other people in the main, and with the world in general, maybe animals if you're interested in song, but other parts of nature. And when you're in the space I'm describing, there is no, there's no definition anymore. You know, there's not other people, this person and that person. There's, 
just a oneness which includes everybody, but you don't, you're not focused anymore. And if you don't focus, then you don't need a movement from you towards that which you focus. And therefore some, some attitude or some, some quality in that movement towards another person, positive or negative or sweet or sour or whatever, you know, or communicative or silent, then these don't operate anymore, you know? Because you, you're, in a way, when you're in that space and you're speaking, you're speaking to everybody equally. I mean, you may be, you may be influencing what I'm saying now, but what is coming from me, you know, you, is really I'm saying it to whoever wants to listen, but I'm not focusing, I'm not really answering you. You know, it's not like we had to, when we were sitting there together, I was asking you. We were chatting, we were sharing experiences we both had. That's different, and I'm focused. I'm focused on you. But at the moment, I'm not focused on you at all. I'm not focused anywhere. I'm just allowing a response to come from within me. And I trust that, and I hope that that's what's needed. And if it's not, it'll be bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. That's the best so, I can do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, when we were talking and chatting just now, um, we got onto the subject of destiny. Yeah. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you could just do his button and then it would work. Oh. You're not getting any sound? Look, I do this button up. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think it's all right. Yeah, I think that's so when we were talking over there, we got onto some stories about destiny. What about destiny? Do you expect things to simply happen? Or are you expressing your free will and choosing? Mysterious. Tie up. I don't think one can ever know. One can't find the place. I think it's beyond us, the place where the personal expression and the destiny meet. That place is invisible. So I can't really say much about it. I think it's a very natural fusion between the two that's inbuilt. And that in a way, looking for it is trying to separate something that's actually one. It's like a dynamic through the person, which includes, as I said to you before, the future and the past and the present and the person, and it's all fused together. So, in a way, it's all running along like a mountain stream, really. Um, and yet you can have things in the mountain stream which seem to go this way and that way and miss this wave and, not going, and go off on the side and then come back into the current again. But in a way, it's still always continuously part of the stream. So I think it's all the stream. It's all the stream on some level. Yeah. And you can come out of the stream and then you can measure things that are on the bank and get stuck on the bank. Yeah. And then see the stream as a stream as opposed to being part of the stream. And then you can discuss the relationship of the stream to the banks of the stream to the bushes beside the stream, to the fish in the stream. <laughs> you, can do all that. you can do all that, you know. You can come out and then separate something that is just a simple flow. Or you can also say, oh, so it's true, it's all just one flow. From birth to death, or maybe before birth to after death. I mean, a lot, maybe the majority, in fact, of human beings, they're always looking for what's the best or the good for them, yeah? Mm -hmm. And when we were talking before, <clears throat> we were easily agreeing that actually something that one day might seem not really very good, the next day or sometime later could turn out to be just the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> mm. So that would be it. That would be either being in the flow or coming out of the flow and saying, you know, 
rivers then go straight to the ocean. So you're in the river and suddenly the river turns and starts going backwards, you know, like the Thames does when it goes through London. You, know? you look at the Thames like that, it's winding like this, and you think, ah, but I want to go, the ocean's over there. What am I doing going backwards here? I'm going all along. My God, will I ever reach it? Maybe I'll go back to the source again, you know, and have to start again, you know. But in fact, then the, the river turns and slowly it arrives its own way. The work of the slopes. The movement of the river is the work of the slopes. And slopes don't necessarily go in a straight line. They take it meanderingly. You were saying something else that I found very in. Hmm? Just, maybe, just well, do the button. Maybe, I do the better. Better. maybe then the shirt won't fall. Yeah. <laughs> Much better. Yeah. You see? Maybe yeah. it's too. Yeah. It's more stable now. Yes. You were saying something very interesting earlier because you said something like, "Well, my life goes in a certain flow, and then sometimes it seems to go into a pool and, and there's no movement and it's like nothing really happens for some time, mm -hmm. and then there is a momentum again." Mm -hmm. Could you say something about that? Well, it's a bit, I think, like the alchemy that I talked about, Hermenendo, that. Somehow that you don't, in order to change the vibration of a metal, which they attempted to do, and to transform it into gold, then the way they saw it, the angle, the, the line that they took was not to change, say, iron, so to, into something that it was not, but to break it up to its basic component and then in a way reassemble it on an atomic level, on a vibrational level, electronic electron level, so that it became gold. So not to change it from, from that to that, but to dissolve this into its basic components and then reconstruct it or redevelop it so that it ended up like the hand. So the fist becomes the hand, but not to try and change the fist into the hand. So it's more like that somehow that you have a momentum and you're moving in a certain direction and your activity is fully involved and then somehow it comes to an end in some way or you reach some, some limit or you get sick, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be, that it, anyway it comes to an end. And then most people immediately say, well, what else can I do? I'm saying, oh, I'm saying, well, for me, mostly it is that I just let go of that whole project that I've been on and go into a, a place which is a basic place of aliveness, but without any direction. And then to be patient in there or to wait in that until some, some, something else comes, some catalyst comes from somewhere and draws me into another direction altogether. But uh, the gap is necessary, and so that you get this feeling of uh, something ending being one thing, and then be beginning to be something else, rather than converting from being one thing to another thing. It's more difficult when people are always trying to change themselves. That's a very difficult thing to do, because the structures, you know, have to bend the structures. So rather than bending structures or trying to change, like this house, put it around so that I get a bigger sitting room, I have to move house. If I want a sitting room twice the size, I have to move house or build my own house. I can't stretch this. You know? There's a limit to what you could do for the set structure, but there's no limit to what you can do from nothingness. What can be done, what can emerge from nothingness. Would you like to comment about creativity? Do you think, for example, we're going to Italy tomorrow and um, we're going to see Michelangelo's work, maybe, you know, for example, and he's a kind of acknowledged genius, and there is a sense that um, there was no Michelangelo doing that sculpture, you know, was coming in a way from nothing. In the same way, this as I was describing, the yeah. piece of granite, huh? Right. Yeah. And then, but he's, he looks at it and he sees what he's going to 
make out of it already before he starts. Huh? Yeah. And he just fulfills that objection. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, creativity. Well, let me start off a bit personal experience. You know, in 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 my seminars, well, you saw, you say you've seen a few videos, but emerged. I don't, I already do them now, but the train we do them on the training, and my assistant does them on the training. There are hundreds of little structures, explorations that people do to bring them into the space that I've been talking about through interaction with other people. You know. And all of these emerged in the middle of a seminar, in the sense that I would be in the space, uh, I mean, I'm going back now 25 years, you know, 30 years, 30 years. I would say to people, pick a partner, right, and make a group of four, right, do this, and then put your hands like that, make a diamond, and I would be hearing it for the first time. Some of them would be transcribing and remembering it afterwards and writing it up. You know. And all of these came in this way, that none of them came, ah, I know, if I do that with the people, then it should work out that they would have such, such an experience, which is in the right direction. I would simply hear myself saying, do this, take hands, take the finger, follow the finger, with my, and all of them, all of them, without exception, emerge spontaneously out of being in a certain space with other people and the creativity and this, this kind came just like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's what I was getting at. That's my yeah. <clears throat> also my own experience. Yeah. It's like that. You know, I'm totally shocked how um, I'm just sitting quietly, and suddenly this incredible idea comes out of absolutely nowhere. Yeah. Out of nowhere. And then it gets manifested. Yeah. Action out of emptiness. I've got two tattoos on my arm here. One is a circle, which says emptiness, and the other one is a sword, which says action. So sometimes when you get to emptiness, you feel, oh my God, there's nothing here, nothing's going to happen, and that can you feel like you've you've lost all the so-called creativity you had before, which came out of somehow exploring and one thing triggering off another, and so on, and one thing leading to another. But then you sink into nothingness. Then suddenly a movement comes, even a joke comes. You know, you remember that that was something. You say you yourself say something, and you think, where did that come from? I mean, it's not like my normal sound statement it seems to come out of nowhere. But of course, nowhere. When you go to nowhere, you're tapping, I guess, universal creativity. So, if you're in some relationship with whatever is available there, then you will connect with it and you would express it. <clears throat> it appears essential to meet a master and surrender to that master. Who is the master? What is the master's role? And how to recognize a true master? Well, I think that's starting at the wrong end. You know, what is the master? What is his role? You know, I, I've always done what comes naturally. I mean, I can't. I always, I always have to be myself as far as I, I'm aware of myself. And before I, I felt I wasn't myself. I was still as much myself as I thought I could be. You know. The path of authenticity, and that's what Osho actually said to me, your path, which I knew anyway, your path is the path of authenticity. Just be true to yourself, and it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, you will reach the rightness of yourself. You know? okay. So, now I've lost the question, what was it now? <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. About, about a master, you know. Oh yeah, about the master, what is a master, you see? So, the so that's the way I've worked. You know? And I see that out of my relationship with energy, it's quite clear that to some extent I have a lot of mastery over energy dimensions. I have it. I mean, I've been given it. It's, it's just a fact. 
You know, I haven't mastered it so much as it's come to me. You know, I see that I can do amazing things with energy. I see I can look at somebody lying on the floor and I can move my hand and their body will turn over, you know, what it's worth. You know, but some, not, not, not just to play games, but I see that if I'm working with them and I happen to feel that's the right thing to do, the effect is always immediate. I see I can walk into a room with 100 people and that within three minutes everybody will be in silence. You know, they just fall into silence even if they don't want to be in silence. It will happen, you know, and I see that's an energy thing, you know. So I see that I have, I've been given, I'm saying I have, I've been given a certain mastery. I'm sure that it's much more possible than what I can do and may, maybe will evolve in the time to come because I think energy is, is a new evolution for me. You know, I see that I have a mastery over and I see that the work I do leads people to say that Michael is a, an energy master or he's a master also because I do other things too and try and help people with their lives. But I can't start with saying, well, I'm a master, and your relationship to me has to be such and such a thing. And if you're not, then I'm going to kick you out, or I'm not going to give you anything because you're not related to me. I can't do that. You know, It has to evolve. It has to come naturally from who I am and what I do. And people appreciate what I do, and they get a lot of what I do, so I get a lot of love from people, I get a lot of appreciation, I get a lot of respect from people. This comes, but I don't demand it. I don't say, if you don't give me this, then you can't be my, my disciple or my student, you know. So I can't start saying, I'm a master, what is the appropriate thing for a master? I just accept that whatever comes from me being who I am and doing the work that I do, that's the situation that prevails, and that's my relationship with people. It emerges from, from the reality of my work. And whether people can, well, I know that, you see, all the people that I connect with, with these dimensions through resonance, through resonance is what I use, I mean, I go in the place myself and we're all the same, so the other person also, by, by connecting with them and through the energy lines and with their bodies in certain ways, I can bring them to resonate with me so that we're vibrating on the same level, you know. Um, What's the point of that? Sorry. What, what is the master's role? Right, the master's role, yeah, right. So the point was that these people, all of the people that I work with, have up to now not been able to find those dimensions themselves. And quite likely would never have done. Maybe one or two would have done. They would not have done. Oh, they're, they're there. You know? But to find them is difficult, but if I can manifest them, manifest them rather, in a in a body and in a in a, a form that is familiar to them and which they can directly relate to, then they can receive it from me. You know, when I move my hand like that and I touch somebody on the shoulder and they start vibrating or fall over, or whatever, what I'm bringing was already there, but they were not falling over and they were not vibrating. You know, of course, it's added to. Added my human touch, of course, it's important. But the thing is, what I'm actually taking into them is something that is already already there. I mean, I am receiving what I'm giving to people, but I'm receiving without anybody giving it to me. I've just found a way to open to it and allow it to come in and become part of my being when I'm working, especially. I can simply say, you can use me in a way. I'm not saying that, but in amounts, I would say, if I can do anything for these people through energy, you can use me. I'm available. I have nothing. I have no restrictions in me. I have no demands. I have no feeling that it has to be a certain way. You know, I can become one with the energies. You know, I'm happy to do that for these days I'm here. And then I go to people and then I can bring that which they cannot connect with to them because I'm an intermediary. I'm a human intermediary, so I, I give it to them in a way that they can receive it. Because they're used to being hugged, or touched, or felt, or spoken to, or smiled at, or looked at. That's not so unusual. I mean, look at people in a special way. They may sometimes, when I look at them, they can't look back, you know. Not that I'm doing any goggling, but it happens, you know. But the thing is, looking at them is not something very strange. You know? So, in other words, all that I do, in a way, is maybe extreme, in a quiet way, have an extreme effect on people, 
But what I'm doing is very normal. I'm just a guy walking around the room, smiling at people and putting my hand up like that, doing a little dance in the center of the room like you've seen on the video, doing strange things, you know, but uh, I'm a familiar person. I'm a person and first people are familiar. So in a way, they will, they will connect with me. They're not afraid of me. You know? They're not thinking, I'm, some, I'm not, you know, I've got a goblin's head, you know, or I'm not a gorilla, you know, I'm not something they feel immediately, I can't connect with that. It's something, I'm somebody that is a very normal human being to look at. So they get open to me, and then I can feed them it's something which they cannot get directly. And I'm hoping that by doing that, that part of them would awaken to the, such an extent that they will then be able to connect directly themselves with it, as I can do. And how to recognize a true master? <clears throat> well, I've already quoted you what, uh, what your client said, you know, you recognize him, does he take you away from yourself? Oh, that was not my words, that was something that of course I have some sympathy with, that statement. How do you recognize the human mind? Well, I think in my case it's a bit different from maybe from other teachers. And because I said that my work is resonant, is through resonance, that, and I said to you that I felt immediately an affinity with you when I met you, when I saw you, when I, even when I saw your picture. I thought, I'll get on with that guy, okay. That, that, it, that it's as if even before they reach the true vibration, that, that people's own vibration has an affinity with other people's vibrations. And that I think for most of the people who come to me and stay with me for a while, there is the similar resonance that I have with you, and that we feel part of the same, let's say when, when, the, when the Big Bang happened, you know, we were all <laughs> close together, you know, before we got scattered everywhere, we were like even atoms in a, in a little area in that place, and then we all knew each other, and there was a certain vibration in that part, and then we recognized it, and we came, so people were, aha, I'm this guy, this feels right, he feels right for me. So it's not a question, how does he know, how do I know he's the right guy because he does this, or like John Glenn says, he takes me away from myself. I feel comfortable, I feel okay, I trust this guy, I feel warm-hearted towards him, I felt a fellow feeling towards him, and I feel that his work, his, his energy work is in fact appropriate for me, fits me, works for me. So if those things combine, then I've got a, I've got a student, you know. And, uh, and he's got a teacher. And, and it just goes on. From there. So it's like the, the relation, if there is such a relationship as master and disciple or teacher and student, it emerges from the basic relationship. You know? I mean, I don't walk around like a master, you know. I don't walk into my groups, you know, like a master and sit on a nice big chair, you know, and somehow say, well, here I am. You can see I'm a master, so what can I, <laughs> how can I help you? you know? I don't, you know. I mean, I move around, and I mean, I have some status. Well, I do have a chair, and they're sitting on the floor. There is a certain amount, though sometimes I sit on the floor too, you know. But um, you know, it's like somehow I'm just a guy, you know. I go, I wander into the room, but then I do, I'm, I do certain things, or I'm in a certain state, or my presence is strong, and then people start relating to the actual situation. Of course, some of them come in with ideas, oh, they've heard about this guy, and they use it, and just fantastic, and da -da, so already, like, come on, they're saying, ah, oh, you know, they're in some awe, you know, that does happen with new people, but most of the people who know me, I mean, they're not in awe of me, I mean, if they are, it's because it's about something that they've experienced rather than something they've heard, you know, because some of the things I do are, are very awesome, but after a while they get used to that, they think that's just the way it goes, that's the way it works, you know. So I feel that somehow that, you know, it's, I'm not creating immediately a situation in which is anybody coming and say, well, he's the, he's the master and they're, and, and they're the disciples who are all sitting there, somehow looking and asking questions and getting the right answers and help and guides and things like that. It's, it's more amorphous than that. It's formless than that. And I just <coughs> move around a lot amongst people, connect them and, and so on. Mm. So I'm rather a special kind of catalyst person amongst all the other people. And if they want to translate it into the, the known formula of master and disciple, they can do that. But I don't actually feel that's actually very accurate for me because I don't see myself as being somehow aligned with 
most of the people who adopt that role and are happy to adopt that role and maybe are absolutely worthy of, his, of adopting that role and can do the work of the master and treat the people like a disciple and go through the more traditional ways of master and disciple relationship. I don't feel I do that. I mean, as you talk, I'm getting this uh, memory of a story, you know, how somebody came to visit the Zen master and they saw this guy in the garden and they asked him, you know, how to find the master. And he said, oh, you go this way and yeah. that. And then when the guy found find the building in the end, the same guy he met yeah. in the garden yeah. sitting in the chair. Yeah. I always liked that story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I know the story. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, there are masters who do... Yeah, yeah. Quite a big production. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm against that. You know, it's wrong. Not at all. I don't. I don't. I don't have any criticism of that at all. It may be what, what works. If it works, and people are getting from that set up. I mean, Osho was like that. I mean, you know, he was on his own. He was there. He was the master. He was there. There was no question who was the master at any time. There was never any question about that. And everybody was a distance. If you meet, you say in his early book, Where are the White Clouds? What do I do if I meet you when I'm walking? He said, You don't speak to me. You don't talk to me. You ignore me. You mm -hmm. pretend I'm not there. That's the first book. Where are the White Clouds? He said, that. If you meet me, don't communicate with me as if I'm some guy you've met. Whereas, of course, if I meet somebody on the garden there, hi, you know, I mean, Beautiful roses, you know. I mean, I, I mean, it's perfectly natural for me to have a one-to-one -one conversation with them or whatever. You know? So I'm not saying that it's wrong. It worked for him. Look how well it worked for him. Look how many people got so much from him, and how many people he had, you know. But it does. It worked for him, but it doesn't work for me. So the way I work is the way it works. Right. You've talked a few times about Osho, and obviously. I can sense when you talk about him, there's a lot of devotion towards Osho. I can feel it in your energy and your words. Traditionally, devotees had tremendous devotion to the master. Please say something about devotion in the pursuit of awakening. Well, I think there was a period when I felt a great devotion to Bhagwan for some years when I was in Pune. I mean, I wasn't the devotional type. Uh, I wasn't a prem, I was an anant. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I was also, he was also a, a consciousness reality for me, and therefore, because of conscious reality, I was not, what, I mean, there were things about him that I had, a, uh, that I was not so happy with. You know? I mean, I could retain a certain distance, uh, critical distance, let's say, critical distance from him, for sure. From the very beginning, I always could do that. But my heart was very much in love with him for many years. And I think now I would not, I would not say that I, I'm a devotee in respect of Osho. I would say I'm a great admirer of him. I have a great respect for him. And he makes me laugh when I think about him, about the tricks he got up to. He was a, I think he was a real trickster. Um, I think he was very playful when he was when he was tricking. I think he did a marvelous work. I think it was amazing how he got to so many capable people around him who were able to do the work with other mortals that he couldn't do directly because there was too many of them, or it was not quite the work he was supposed to do. I mean, the whole setup, you know, with all the, mm -hmm. the seminars and the meditation teachers and so on, was just an incredible happening. And I think thousands of people. Got transformation out of that, so I have a great admiration for him and respect for him. Um, and do you feel that that devotion is an important part of the the journey for a seeker? Well, I would I would say rather again I have to turn it around a bit, Bhamananda, and say that if you have a great affinity, a respect an appreciation, an affection, an enjoyment, a happiness to be with somebody, then a certain amount of devotion is bound to be there. You know, it doesn't have to be separated from the devotional type, you know, the Janani against the, you know, the, uh, the Bhakti, you know, you know, but they do in India, this, this is your type, that's your type. You know, and some people can just, you know, 
play music and have big eyes and just become one in the heart with the master, you know. I was never that type, not that type. But when you say, is it necessary, I was saying, you say again, you see, I'm, I'm kind of turning some of your questions around. I'm saying, well, it's not a question of it's necessary, but it's inevitable that if you have the right relationship with a, with a teacher, it's inevitable that you will feel some devotion to him. Some pure love, which what devotion is, without any kind of negativity or thoughts coming in to, to cast any shadows on that. It would be a pure feeling of great guy. I love it. <laughs> um, seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. Please describe my typical day and how you perceive the world. What's that got to do with the first part of the question? Well, my sense is that sometimes people have strange ideas about an enlightened person. You know, ah, I see. Like they're sitting in a chair all day, ah, I see. totally in bliss. Oh, I know, get the connection now. I whereas, see. in fact... Of what an enlightened person is. So you want me, as a so-called enlightened person, to describe how an enlightened person spends the day, huh? Yeah? Is that what you're asking? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know where, I mean, there's, there's days here and there's days on my seminars are very different. You know. Here, I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and when I'm on seminars, I get up at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's a good start. With, you know. um, and then I help to see my kids after school in the morning when they're here, which has got nothing to do with anything else than being a father. <laughs> you know, and then... I don't know, I, I spend a lot of time when I'm here answering mail. A lot of people write to me, and I send, you know, I guess, at least 100 emails every week, if not more, to, in exchange with people, you know, and some other letters, and I have meetings with people about the situation. I watch football whenever my team is playing, and sometimes another team. I also watch tennis sometimes. I watch cricket sometimes. I only watch sport and television. Occasionally I see a movie in the evenings. Um, I go for walks around here uh, two or three times a week. and uh, My wife and I go out to dinner maybe once every ten days or so when I come back from the group we usually go out. And in, in general, um, I don't think there's anything particularly extraordinary about the way I pass my days when I'm not in seminars. You know? I think for the people who, who are in the team, then I think being here without me doing anything other than I've described is in some way extraordinary because, I mean, I guess have some kind of energy which is which you've even felt when you come in the house, which is here in the house, and that they drink in, you know, although I'm not directly relating to them very much. It often happens when we're having a meal, we have we eat, and then we stop, and then suddenly there's huge silence will fall, you know. I'm not doing anything, I'm not meditating, I've got my eyes closed. I may even be saying something to Mishko and my kids, but there's huge silence falls, and everybody stops eating. Because if they found finished, they close their eyes and I sit there and I, and I think, well, I'm not doing anything, but everybody's gone into this incredibly deep space and they can't eat and they can't move. And I wait and wait, and then, then I have to get up and go because I know if I don't, they sit there for the rest of the evening. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't be able to move. It's not that they're respecting me, it's that they're, they're, in, they're in the space. They go into the space, you know. And I think, well, thing, I mean, I don't want to sit here all evening with them, and anyway, I'm sure they've got better things to do than sit here. So maybe after 10 minutes or 20 minutes, I just get up and go, and then I walk, through, walk into here, and I hear, click, 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 everybody starts collecting the plates. <laughs> so life goes on, you know. But they haven't stopped because of anything that I've intended to do. I'm not saying now, like doing it, saying grace before the meal, now we have our silence after the meal. It simply happens over and over and over again, most meals. If I don't get up and go, sometimes I get up and go immediately because I've got plenty of things to do upstairs. But if I sit down with them, then the silence and it always happens, and I have to break it. So, my day is not so very different, I think, or, or as far as the features of it are concerned, from, from many other people. There's nothing very special. I don't meditate. I don't, I don't do any meditation. I'm sitting, I mean, sometimes I sit very quietly, sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for an hour. I just find myself, it happens, I sit quietly. You 
know. But I don't believe in meditation, I believe in the meditative space. And I'm often in a meditative space, but I'm not actually doing anything. I fall, just like I described at dinner time, I fall on my own sometimes, and when I'm in my room upstairs, you saw, I fall in the meditative space, and I'll be sitting there, you know, I'll sit there, maybe 15, 20 minutes. I listen to music in the morning, because I use music in my group, so I need to pick music, and nobody can pick music for me, so I get a lot of CDs sent me, or I buy CDs. I have to listen to them, find tracks, that I feel that are commensurate with my work, that I listen with my work, and pick them up, and then I use the music in groups. So, a lot of mornings, for an hour or so, I do that after I get up. I read two newspapers every day, I read the Times print out, I get the Guardian every day, I keep up with the news. So, Nothing very special there, I think. I mean, maybe there is, on another level, something going on that people, maybe if you ask in the house, will say, but there's this very special experience and energy in the house all the time. But I'm not creating that deliberately. It is just something that happens to be there. And so people, it's the same when I go into a group, I don't do anything deliberately, but I walk in, I sit down, and, I say, uh -huh, like that, and suddenly the whole room has gone, Phew! Like that, you know. <laughs> uh, you know I mean, if I, you know, I'm not practicing anything. I mean, I'm really not practicing anything. I'm just being the way I feel. I mean, I'm affected by being in a group, so of course something from sitting and sitting there immediately affects me. But in fact, something takes place in that room when I walk in, which in a way seems to be independent of anybody that's in there, including me. But I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, I just go along with it. It's a lot of the stream. <coughs> the last question. The last question. You, and the last question, as I <laughs> used to say. You've given us a profound discourse on awakening. When you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would your short advice be? But I do meet people with a passion for awakening. And I love it. Oh, I love it. I think this is a real, a real seeker, a real disciple. Whether he stays with me or whether he finds another teacher, I don't care. This guy or this woman has, has it already in them. I can see that they have the potentiality to get to the peak of your capacity. I see it now. It's an energy I feel, or something I see. You know? What advice do I give them? Well, I don't give them any advice, really. I immediately start working with them. In, or the work will come to them in a special way because they are in this state. But I, I probably find that I can radiate more to them. I can embrace them more. That something in me responds to that state they're in. And that, when you see what I do, when I say responds, when something responds, you know, I'm moving out towards this person, say you there. Something is coming like this immediately to this person. Something strong. Because people can only take what they're capable of receiving. <clears throat> so you're saying you can give more to somebody who you feel can receive more? Yes. Or more comes to them. Not that I feel now I can give this person more. More comes. Right. It's like an energy thing. If you've got a big resistance, you know, when in the old days, when the old two-door radio, you know, they had all these resistances in, and you wanted to slow the, the current up, then you put a big resistance. And if you wanted it to go further, you had a small resistance, and if you wanted it to go straight through, you had no resistance at all. You had no resistances, you know. This was a symbol for them. I think that in the army, there was a radio mechanic in the army. So I know about these symbols, you know. So it's like, if there's no resistance there, if you feel there's nothing protecting the person, but they're completely open, even if they may not know they are, then something goes. I don't have to say in my head, this person is dead open. This person is a budding Buddha. So I really have to give them everything I can. You know, it's not, it doesn't work out like that. It's just in, instinctively. It comes to step. <coughs> you mentioned resistance. I can't help asking you that. Um, do you have any tricks or special something for people who you can feel come into a big resistance? Well, 
on the level that I work, there's no, there cannot there's no resistance because nobody knows they live on that level that I usually I work with, and so they haven't set up any defenses on this level. On a person-to-person level, they've set up many defences. You know, they know how to deal, you know, how to catch the ball and throw it back and dodge, you know, and put their armour on, stick at the sky and pretend they misunderstood you, all these tricks that people use. But on an energy level, no one has yet put up any defences because they're not familiar with it and they haven't protected themselves because up to now maybe nothing has come. Also, that they're aware of anyway. Of course, everything is always coming on that level, as well as on the other levels. We're all in touch with one another. It's not that I have invented energy exchanges. They're always there. You know, when you walk in and say, "I don't," I look at that guy. Well, oh, that wasn't too tricky to me. You know, it's coming. You're picking up not just the expression on the faces, but that energy is telling you this or that about them. You know, and you're picking it up without actually knowing what the lines of communication actually are. That is bringing up this understanding ones. This perception that you have in another person, that is actually coming. So this is always going on. Thank you. <laughs> is there anything you would wish to add to this dialogue? I mean, as we were talking, for example, I, I would become, I became aware quite quickly that, in a way, the questions don't particularly fit the way you work, you know. So I don't know if you would like to express something that you feel would more closely, you know, express the way you work. Well, at the moment, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, 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 I've published a lot of books, as you know, more than 30. And just this afternoon, I was working on finishing, and I sent the book out to a couple of friends to get, to go through and make their suggestions. You know, so I'm doing a final editing on it. And then I was just doing it before you came this afternoon, and yesterday, of course, as punishing off. And I came across a talk that I gave at the Rainbow Festival in Baden-Baden last year, and I read this through, and I thought, ah, but that really describes what I do. So I ran a copy off, and I'm going to give it to you because you know that's like you ask me, what do you do? You know, I'm telling people what is happening in my seminars, you know, whereas here I was not. You know, I was somehow just trying to to bring in something of my work in response to the questions, which are very general, which apply, I guess, to all teachers to some extent, but I'm not exactly as you said this government. Exactly. Ideal to get from me. Not uh, the questions were not ideal for me yeah. to express. That's why I'm kind doing, of no, I know. offering so you that, a space yeah, now yeah, where yeah, we could, yeah. we still have some time. Yeah, yeah. If you would want to um, put that long talk into a nutshell, for example. Well, it, it's never easy for me to talk, just to talk from, you know, people sometimes say, tell me, how did you get into energy work? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, so I ca it's hard for me to kind of talk in a way theoretically. So when I was talking to you in this talk, which I'm going to give you a copy of, then, you know, I'm faced with a lot of people. I'm giving a talk in the morning, and in the afternoon I'm giving an, an energy happening, you know. So in a way, in the talk, I'm saying, well, this is the kind of work that I do, you know. I don't, I don't teach through, t through talking very much. I mean, it's an ancillary thing for me, talking, you know. At the end of the groups, usually, I get taught questions and answers, and then people ask questions, either about what's been going on, or more about their lives, or relationships, or something, so else. You know. You know, so in fact, you know, I, I, then then my talk then is purposeful. You know, I'm saying, look, I want you to know what's going to happen. You know, but when you just say, "Well, oh, tell me about your work," you know, <laughs> I don't know. I come to my next seminar. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's, I can't right. do it. I can't do it. It's right. too theoretical for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything you would like to add? In, um, just to give us space again, if you. No, I don't think so. 
I mean, also, I realize that we, when I think about personal things, and we talk quite a while. We talked quite a while together before, talked a bit about my family, you know, how important it is for me and my kids and so on. And we talked about past experiences and about you and I as human beings, really, and our experiences of life, what you've gone through, what I've been going through, some, some of the things. So in a way, I feel I've covered some, not some, some personal grounds, you know, some chats, some, some normal human exchange between between two guys. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.